Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're looking at an amazing, amazing organization that is founded on a theory of change and empowerment and self-sufficiency, of course, for youth exiting foster care with our special guest, Thomas Lee, CEO of First Place for Youth in California, and of course, always expanding expanding to serve new markets. Thomas, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited. Mark, the excitement is mutual. Good to see you. Good morning and uh, greetings to your entire audience. Looking forward to the conversation today. Talk about first place and how we can create the conditions for change. Well, you know, we have a really long history with, with the organization. We first met the founders, uh, uh, Amy Lemley and uh, Deanne uh, uh, Deanna Pearl um, in in Ian Pern, uh, yeah, Pern. Uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, quite a long ways ago. And the thing that I thought was so interesting is not only was not only their passion, but actually how they went about creating the organization, coming out of a study of what was going on with foster youth that were exiting the foster care system. And could you just sort of give us an orientation on that hidden problem? We're not aware of it. But when you look at the statistics, when you look at what happens to youth that are exiting the foster care system, it's really quite astounding, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So they saw a problem and decided that they needed to come up with a solution. The problem was at the time they we here in the state of California, we have the the largest foster care system in the country and Tens of thousands were exiting foster care at age 18 with no place to go. And in, with the expectation that they would go off into the world and find gainful employment and find housing and be able to take care of themselves uh, at the tender age of 18. The problem with that, with that rationale was that many of the youth uh, weren't prepared and trained and given the right type of mentoring and support and life skills in order to do so. Uh, Mark, if you think about it, for a youth to be exiting foster care at the age of 18 means a lot of things went wrong. That means that for some reason or another, they were separated from their biological parents because of neglect or abuse. Uh, two, after that that first encounter or incident, um, there wasn't a, a plan to get them reunified or that plan didn't work out. Then there was no way, there was no one willing to step up that was in the extended family that was willing to take that youth in and raise them as their own. And then there also wasn't an adoptive family or foster family that was willing to take take uh, and love and wrap their arms around those children and say, we're going to be committed to you until you're ready to go off into the world on your own. And so for all of those, for our youth to fall through all of those nets and gaps, then we have them where they where we meet them at first place for youth at 18 years old. And uh, and that's where we feel like the work needs to start anew. And we create a whole new intervention. And, and, and what you end up with is uh, youth at exiting foster care to instant couch surfing, to instant homelessness. That's right. To instant Joblessness. Right. You might have had a young person who has had an uneven education and, and has doesn't have uh, certain skills that you would want them to have for the job market. Executive function skills might have not uh, might have not have been conveyed. Right. And then you have the whole issue of exploitation of, of young people. And so when you start to look at the statistics of what happens between 18 and then 26, you start to see sort of a lot of interactions with with uh uh, social service organizations, with law enforcement, um, with all sorts of different um, agencies that are there to uh, deal with adults now who are part of the, the great sort of cared for um, uh, cluster. How do we present that, prevent that? How does first place prevent that right. tragedy from unfolding? in a way that uh, that young people are empowered and not disempowered and and uh, uh, where, where they don't feel that they have any agency. What is your approach? Yes. So this was the the collective wisdom of Amy Limley and Deanne Pern, the founders of First Place for Youth 25 years ago. They began with the idea, like, let's create the primary 
foundation for safety and security and growth to be, and you begin that with providing them with, a, with providing a young person who's coming out of foster care with a safe place to live. Give them an apartment that's fully furnished, just like you would give your own child when they're going off to college. Housing first, right? Housing, housing, housing first. first. In this respect, housing first, and then you couple it with lots of support services to go along with the housing. And those support services are all focused on teaching the young person about life skills, healthy relationships, helping them find their first job, helping them get enrolled in college, make sure that they have the right tutoring and educational support so they can actually excel once they get into college and finish the classes that they start. It also means being a person who's going to be there unconditionally when the youth makes mistakes over time. And that was the beginning. That's the beginning of first place. That's the beginning of what we have in the state of California called extended foster care, where a young person can stay and get these kinds of supports all the way up to age 21 and even up to age 25 if they need it. And that's how we do this. And, and the key piece for us at first place, the secret sauce of sorts, is that we utilize, um, we take all of that direct support that we give them, we evaluate it to the very tiniest part. And we're always looking at how we can learn to get better and innovate from the knowledge that we gain through our data and evaluation team. And then we take that information to not only change the way, constantly keep changing the way we pro uh, provide our programming and our services, but we use that information to also to advocate at the state and local levels to make sure that policies are supporting the needs of youth. And so that is the triumvirate of the work that we do at First Place for Youth. It's a, it's a part, part practice, part evaluation, part policy. And those three is how we have been able to make a huge impact throughout six counties, throughout the state of California, the counties who have the highest need. And I'm talking about San Francisco, Alameda, Contra Costa, Solano, Santa Clara, and Los Angeles County. There are also a th there's also a theory of, of change and how do you engage with people that are that, that is integrated into your model. So first, it's not an event, it's a process. That's right. right? I mean, that, that underlies everything. Secondly, while you might have replicable elements from young person to young person, it's the individual, not a system. It's not just you know, you're coming in and this is the system conform. Instead, you're meeting the young person halfway. You're providing a system. You create expectations. You you demand certain responses. But, but you look at the one person, one person, and you deal with that one person. And that's more right. of a familial approach rather than a systems approach. That's right. right. That's right. And the, young, and the other thing is power. It isn't just like, the the agency or the adults have the power, right? If that's going to happen, it becomes a system and it, it, it just sort of falls apart. That's how do, right. How do you navigate the power dynamics? Because you can't really be doing all the things that you and your wisdom thinks is right, because for that individual, it might be wrong. And that person also has a say. How do you deal with that when you're dealing with a young person? That's right. So good. You know, I love that you you pointed out the the system aspect because that's a I say a new prong of our work that we have been very intentional about building out here in the state of California and also around the country. And so, if I were to back up a second, I've always um, operated from a maxim that we need to be hard on systems and soft on people. And so, when it comes to the actual delivery of our services, it is about understanding that each and every one of the six hundred or more youth that we serve in our direct My First Place program with housing and all the support services, we have to treat them as individuals. We have to have the right levels of empathy and patience and be able to give them time to grow and learn until they learn how to take care of themselves. And, and on the system side and that power side, we're always contending with some of the strictures and regulations and um, the lack of resources that we're getting from the public side. A lot of our funding comes from the state and, and county government, but it's never all, it's never enough to cover the whole cost 
to do this work well. And so it's incumbent on us to make sure that we are continually to tur continually turning the screws on the larger system, but at the same time, making sure that we're building strong, engaging relationships and community with the youth and using their voice to help us make the case for changes in regulation, changes in policy, help us advocate. We just a couple of weeks ago, I was in Sacramento with about eight of our youth and we were talking to state legislators about upcoming bills that we need their support on that could materially change the trajectory of so many foster youth, not just uh, that are living and getting supported by First Place for Youth, but for foster youth across the entire state of California. And so that's, again, where we have this two-prong, uh, multi-prong approach, where we're thinking about how do we continually have a fidelity and sensitivity to the needs of the youth that we have in program, but at the same time, understanding that we have to always continue to push the envelope when it comes to how sy systems are supporting our youth. And that, I think, is probably is a good segue to something that I think is really new, exciting about First Place for Youth, where our work is not self-serving. Again, I want to hammer that, home, that point home. Our work is all about how can we serve as many foster youth as possible. And sometimes we do it indirectly. And that's done through our systems change work. Uh, right now, First Place for Youth is not only based here in the state of California, we have a presence in five states around the country. We're in Mississippi, North Carolina, Ohio, Massachusetts, and also New York. We're currently also in talks with uh, the state of New Jersey. And the purpose of all of those events happening around the country is how can we export what we've learned after 25 years of direct service, evaluation, and advocacy? How can we help other regions and child welfare systems and states get their extended foster care systems up and running in a way that they're purposeful and it creates a standard of care that every foster youth can have the opportunity to really go after their hopes and dreams without fear that uh, they're not getting what they need. And, um, and I think one of the things important to note about this is that the reason why we feel like this is so important right now, there are 33 states in our union that have extended foster care services. Many of them have yet to put together a system of care that is working. So right now we're seeing across the country that only 22% of youth that are eligible for all of the support and housing and entitlements that have been advocated for by so many across the country are being utilized by youth. And so we've got to do a better job in raising and in elevating the, the issues we have to do a better job at elevating the issues and showing our foster youth in a much better light. And, well, and, and, and making sure that that the young people who need the help, who for whom health, who for whom funding has been set aside, that they actually can connect with that help and receive it. Right. That's right. And, and that's you're right. an enabling organization. Let's talk a little bit about how you shape your staff. Because this is, this is a really important element. You've got a lot of back office functions. You have a lot of business competencies that you need that any organization of your scale and sophistication needs, finance, uh, tech, and so on and so forth. Right. But I'd like to focus on how do you serve youth? How do you ensure that youth are served by people with the credibility to be accepted by those young people? Because you're talking about young people who um, are of different ethnicities. They are of different identities and orientations. They've had different life experience. We do a lot of work with addiction recovery, mental health. We have a lot of uh, interactions with um, uh, um, uh, law enforcement and uh, social services. And when you're talking languages and so on, you could be talking about people who primarily are bilingual or or uh, coming from different places in in their lives, when they're interacting with somebody like me, they see something that they might embrace or not embrace. It might create a barrier, right? I will not be in my person. I will not be the right person to connect with every single person out there. Neither will you. How do you ensure that you have enough diversity in your in your? Right. Staff? Right. In terms right. of perspective, life experience. I'm not talking, you know, race. Oh, or yeah. I know. I know. You know what I mean? I do. How do I you do. do that? 
<laughs> what is the magic? I, I appreciate that question. Let, let me start with this. Youth that have been in foster care have incredible antennae for figuring out who is really authentic and cares deeply and empathetically with them. And that ha- and they see through the skin color. They see through all of the superficial things that we use to identify ourselves. They, are, they really can tap into where the heart is. And so what, what we try to do through our vetting process of people who want to come and work with us and work with youth is we want to tap into not only understanding what their skill sets are, what their capacity is for growth. We want to understand what are their values? Where is their heart? Are they committed? Do they love the art of raising children? And if they have, they love the art of raising children and almost see it as a calling of sorts. Not everyone's going to have it. That's a rare, a rare group that has that calling. But if we can find, we try to look for people who really believe it is their avocation to work with youth and help build them and draw out the best out of them over time. And sometimes that requires some training. Not everyone is able to tap into it on day one. So that means that we have to do a a really strong and robust onboarding program. We have a full-blown curriculum of professional development that happens over the course of a year. But it also, it also, you know, taps in like how wide of a net are we casting to find those rare people that really love the art. And you're training your people. You're bringing them through a process as well. When you when you're interviewing them, you are looking at them through the eyes, not only of the organization, but also as uh, through the eyes of you. So there's kind of a parallel view that that you're looking at. Right. And then you're also shaping education so that you can meet that individual where they are and provide them with the support they need so that they in turn can provide uh, youth. How do you ensure that that since it's not a one on one kind of a thing, it's a many on one? That's right. Kind of a thing. And the only way you can do that efficiently is to ensure that the organization itself is able to respond. But there is there is someone who is primarily going to be the contact with with the young person. How does that actually work in terms of the interaction between the person who is the primary contact? or the people with the primary contact with that young person, and then the other network of services that you provide? Well, let me just start by saying, Mark, if you ever need another another job, we'd take you on in a heartbeat because you have such a uh, acute understanding of how we do things internally. You would jump in and hit, and hit the ground running on our team. So let me say the first thing to start is building relationships and trust with our youth. And like you said, we have multiple people. We have three dedicated professionals that are focused on each and every youth. One that's focused, that's called our youth advocate. We have another one that's focused on education and employment, another that's focused on housing. And the primary person is that youth advocate. That youth advocate is the one that is giving the high dosage, high touch relationship building work where they're meeting with you several times a week in their apartments, in the community, showing up consistently and following through on everything that they're supposed to. That's where the beginning of the foundation, that relationship begins. How many of your staff have themselves been in foster care or or interacted with the system? Let me tell you, we have a high we have a high percentage of staff that have lived experience in the foster care system. Uh, if you were to ask me what that that total numbers, I couldn't give you anything but approximation. But just let me say this: um, not only do we not only do we have staff throughout the organization horizontally and vertically that have lived experience in foster care, even on our board, we have a high a, you know high percentage of former foster youth that are serving as a part of the governance of the organization. So it is something that we've invested in and feel like it's incredibly important for us to deliver our work and also continue to hold us accountable for being able to make sure that we're following through on everything that we promise through uh, what we believe is our, uh, what we believe will make the kind of impactful changes that will help set these young people on a whole new trajectory. That's so important. So you're you're taking a strength that is inherent in the community and you are combining it with other, other people with other strengths to create a solution for the community. It's really a solution that comes out of the center of 
of these collaborations. Um, and it is not something that is coming in from uh, government or from the outside. It actually comes from within the community. So as you, as you expand, and you're talking about expanding to other states, how do you ensure that that aspect, that you're coming in from the, from the heart of the problem, that you are, uh, you are solving, the heart of the challenge that you are solving. And so the people who are um, doing the solving are able to hit the ground running in ways that I really can't, you're very generous, but um, really that, that that they're coming in when, when you're talking about New Jersey or Massachusetts or some of the other states that you mentioned, how do you actually plant that seed, identify those collaborators and start to set up an organization? Great question. So it begins with, a level of recognition from people who could ultimately become ambassadors and champions for change in some of the other regions where we serve. You have to first understand what the issues are in your own in your own backyard, in your own home. The geographies, right? That's right. Everyone has different issues. You know, again, we we have representation in Midwest, South, East Coast. The conditions are different in everyone. There's different political climates in each one. There's different drivers for everyone. So first is identifying a champion, somebody that understands or has a has a thought about what some of the issues are. They have also analyzed some of those issues and they have taken a step, uh, taken a step forward and said, we want to change this. We want to do something different and better than what we've been doing. We're failing an inordinate amount of young people by the current way that we're t- delivering these programs. We so want an to- understanding of the lay of the land, right? Yeah. There's the credibility on the ground, but there's also an understanding. They have to have the appreciation of where there is a deficiency that you can make up. That's right. They're actually looking at you, the people that you're bringing in, they're looking at you as a vehicle for them to solve a problem. And that's that's the thing that creates the, the basis for an agreement that that person might join your, your Absolutely. team. And typically from that point, once uh, once they you know come to that recognition about what they would love to see or reimagine in their own backyard, that's where we try to come in and uh, introduce ourselves as being willing to take a look at some of the assumptions that they're making. We come in and do a deep analysis and a scan of what the lay of the land is in their region or their system. And then we come up with some recommendations and those recommendations have ultimately yielded in deeper work to transform how those systems are working, to figure out how do we make sure that we pull the right levers to get the right funding from the federal and state level to pour in, to subsidize the work? How do we also train and get certain staff thinking differently and more purposefully and intentionally about how youth are served. And then finally, how to make sure that all of this is codified so it can play out over time once we back out and let them do what they know how to do best. And mutuality here, you're not coming in as the, as the organization that has a solution trying to imprint, you're coming in to understand what they know, share what you know, and then together shape an approach that works for that particular state, that particular region, that particular city, and particularly those those youth that you wish to serve. Absolutely. And you asked the question earlier, Mark, about, about the power aspect. A part of our analysis and developing recommendations involves bringing the youth voice into the conversation to co-create the new design or the new solution for how that a particular child welfare system will be reimagined. And so by having those voices, that's where we are taking the power and utilizing that the strong imprint of 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 youth thinking to figure out what what their experience and let their own experiences drive the changes that everybody wants to see. And that's what really makes this work so worthwhile doing. And um, and of course, we're always looking for others and other ambassadors and champions to join us in this effort. Uh, we're not going to be set. We're not going to be satisfied until uh, we see the the like I said, I mentioned earlier, there's 33 states that are actually providing a form of extended foster care. Uh, the remaining are still hedging uh, whether or not that's something that they want to do. The question for us now is how do we make sure that we get ourselves connected 
to each and every one to help inject the virus for good. So that way there is a, a real extended foster care system that is the 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 lay of the land. It's, it's set up for all foster youth, no matter where they live in the, in the entire country. So everybody can get the services that they need in order to be healthy and whole. It's a great point. What you're saying is, is that regardless as to whether the services are provided, there are youth out there who have no option and need these services. But you have to be smart in how you're using your limited time and resource, and you must have willing partners. So you are prioritizing based on enthusiasm to serve. And you're basically saying, if you're not enthusiastic to serve, the need is still out there. Please look at it. Right. But we're going to focus here because we can actually transform our time into impact more quickly. And I think that that's that it, it's a really it, it's a sad trade off, but it's a necessary trade off in order for you to have the impact that you wish to have. Thomas Lee, CEO of First Place for Youth, this has been a terrific discussion. Let's do this again, because I'd like to continue to unpack uh, your future because you've got a whole set of plans uh, out there. So would you come back and, and we'll do this uh, again, maybe in a few months as as your plans start to unfold? and. and- All right. I would, I would absolutely love to, Mark. I uh, love having this conversation. You help draw out the why and the need for these services. You're talking about our work is that able, you know, if we can do our work and get more believers involved, because I've always said that no one's absolved from being responsible for what's happening to young people that are going into foster care. If we can get more people involved and help shed a brighter light on these issues, this is actually a problem that we can solve in our lifetime. We can actually make sure that young people all across this country are getting what they need in order to be success, successful in their own right. And so how many problems can you solve in our lifetime? Uh, there's not many. And so this is a huge opportunity for us. And, uh, and Mark, I love that you've given us a platform to share our work, and I'd be happy to come back anytime you'll have me. Thanks so much, Thomas. My pleasure. Take care.